Several years ago, I was in Somalia. For those of you who may not know, it's in the northeastern corner of Africa. I was there as an expert to train a local organization staff on how to work with children. For the process, I called some children. We were sitting out in the open over there in the village. I called some children who were playing around to join us so that I could demonstrate to the team how you actually work with children on the ground. It's a difficult process to work with children. You need tools, you need creativity. And I had come with about 10 years of training of doing this in different countries, in Africa, in India, and training people to do this. So I came with some knowledge and a sense of knowing what I was doing in this area. 30 minutes later, and I'm hiding behind a car tire with two of the children who I'm shielding because there are gunshots flying all over the place. What has happened? I don't know. But there are people running, screaming. There's just chaos going on all around us. I sit. I don't know what to do. After some time, someone comes, runs away with the children. There seems to be a lull. So I dash to where my colleagues have. They've already run away a long time ago, by the way. So I dash to where they are. They open the door. They let me in, and I sit down with them. We keep listening at what's going on. There's still some noise and commotion going on outside. But after about 40 minutes or so, things seem to be quietening down. And we think that things have settled. Just then, there is a knock on the door, and a gentleman comes in. My colleague and he, they have a conversation. It is in Somali. I don't understand what's going on at all. But my colleague is tensing up. The gentleman leaves. My colleague shuts the door, turns around, looks at me, and says, you need to pack and leave now. I'm like, what is this? He says, well, the villagers think that you are the reason for this fight. You are the one who has created this gun battle, and your life is at risk. OK, I pack. And I leave, <laughs> because what can I do? I don't know what to do. After I have gone some distance, and the village is now a little bit behind me, I think about what just happened here. <laughs> and of course, I say that was a big mistake. What did I have to do with this? Somebody is shooting somebody in the village? What about, why are they blaming me? What have I done? I was in complete denial. But when you know that you've just escaped a chance bullet that could have got you, it's a little bit easier to accept that you made some mistakes over here. So I stop and I think, what happens? The truth is, the people that I was training, they did at some point tell me, one of the boys was taken away by the father, and they stopped me and they asked me, what should we do? I had no idea. I said, what do we do? The father has come, taken the boy. We continue. We work. I did not understand the gravity of the situation. And I did not ask my staff why they were even asking this question of me. You see, I was the expert. And they were asking me. So I was not going to ask them. What do you think? This was not happening. I came to know later that actually there was a custody battle going on about this boy. And the mother and the father were fighting with each other. And the mother had left this boy in the playground with us where we were working. And the father had taken the boy away. And the mother got really angry. And so she got a family. And the two families got into a fight. And that's what resulted in the shootout. Things do happen like this in the world. Zabna and Lewitt, who wrote this book called Freakonomics, which is actually a bestseller and has sold 7 million copies all across the world, said that the hardest words for humans to say are not 
I love you, but I don't know. Think of a time, and some of you are in class, when the teacher asks you a question you don't know, you just want to somehow vanish from this room. You don't want to be there. You don't want the teacher to remember your name. You don't want her to see you somehow, or her, him to see you. You just want to disappear. Because it's just so embarrassing to stand and say, I don't know the answer, I don't know. And this is self-talk that happens to all of us. We think, what will our peers think? Won't we just appear stupid if we don't know something? And then think of a time now, you're an MBA, you're a PhD, you're a CEO, some kind of an expert, and you're asked something you don't know. You think you're going to stand up and say, I don't know? Of course not. Nobody's going to do that. It actually only gets harder with time. The self-talk is exactly the same as it was for the child. I don't know, what am I going to do? But it's only getting harder because you're supposed to know. And you're in that position because you have some knowledge. But why do we feel compelled to answer? Why do we want to always come up with an answer when we don't know an answer? Well, science has a theory. So scientists believe that when you know something, your body actually sends a positive stimulus, and this releases dopamine, which is a hormone that makes us feel good. So that's a great solution. I know something, and my body rewards me for it. I've been in many places when eyes are all at me, and I'm expected to give an answer, and I know I don't know the answer. I clearly don't. But what do I do? I fumble for words. I dig deep in my brain for some speck of memory that may hopefully be there and try and create some intelligent sounding sentences which are really rubbish. But I try, right? And I'm not the only one who does it. Each one of us does it. We all try to fake it. We all try to lie in a way. Because you see, today's culture is one where confidence is really the archetype for success and excellence. It's as if, if you could speak with confidence, you win, you're rewarded for this. But it isn't always the case. Now just imagine if Bill Gates was standing here and you or you or somebody actually got to ask him a question and you ask him a question on Microsoft. And he listens to your question, takes a moment, and says, you know what? I don't know the answer. What does he mean he does not know? He is Mr. Bill Gates. He should know everything about Microsoft. It is his product. It is his company. How can he not know? It doesn't sound right, does it? But it's interesting that this happens because what will actually happen is when you walk out of the room after having asked Bill Gates, you will feel better about yourself. Because you know what? If Bill Gates cannot answer a question, it's okay if you cannot also. According to the Stanford University Graduate School of Business, you know, when experts express uncertainty as opposed to utter confidence, people are actually drawn towards them. It's almost as if when you throw your masks away and you let yourself be, that people are drawn to you and that people recognize this vulnerability as honesty. And it is in this that the words, I don't know, create a huge value because it connects us deeper to people and allows us to be relatable to each other. When we don't admit and we masquerade and we don't utter the words, I don't know, we make it impossible to learn. We cannot learn if we remain closed. But when we say, I don't know, it just opens the world of possibilities for us. Because now, 
We accept something, so then our borders are open. We are not programmed the way we are, and it just opens our life up to new events and new possibilities that we hadn't actually imagined before. So, the next time you have an opportunity, do say, I don't know. Don't, don't run away from it. I've done a number of interviews for people, right? So I've interviewed a number of people for various jobs. I've been super impressed with the kind of confidence that people come with into these rooms. They, you know, express, there are some who would say what we want to hear, but they express great intelligence and they speak very, very confidently. We rarely recruit them. And we cannot quite put our finger on why it is that we're inclined to select somebody else. But in conversations with a number of my friends in the human resource field and in a lot of analysis, we discovered that the reason why we are inclined to select someone is because they're admitting to something they don't know. And this is what creates a sense of honesty and integrity about them. Employers like this. Employers like people who come in with openness and bring integrity to the table. And those are the guys who get recruited. But you don't have to say, I don't know. You can say, I'm not so sure. I don't know enough. I know a little bit about this, or I have an opinion about this. And you can get by, because in your head, you are still saying, I don't know and opening yourself up to better possibilities. So the next time, when you don't know something, please stand up and say, I don't know, in some manner. When you say, I don't know, and follow it up with a commitment to actually learn more, you're going to move leaps and bounds ahead. There are many things that these three words do, and in short, Firstly, they help you to learn because they open you up. Secondly, they make you closer to people. You become more relatable. Thirdly, they're going to build a lot of confidence because if you can stand up and say, I don't know, you can do many things in life. Fourthly, they're going to actually make it possible to have greater collaborations because if you can say, I don't know, so can the next guy. And then we can all collaborate better. And fifthly, might help you get that job. It might. Also, it's going to make you a real expert because you're going to learn in ways that you hadn't before. There is some magic in it, in a way. So if you propel yourself and you say this, the magic is going to propel you to actually become a real expert and to become a genuine leader for tomorrow. And hopefully, you will not go creating gun battles like I did. Thank you very much.